Before we get going into your Hockey IQ podcast episode, I want to thank our sponsor, Rapid Shot. Rapid Shot is the smart shooting lane. Uh, it's like a batting cage for hockey players. Very cool. Tracks your shot in three ways. Accuracy, shot speed, and reaction time. Uh, easy to use. Uh, actually, I used it when I played and was growing up. Very easy. Simply scan your phone in, select your settings, and start shooting. Uh, you can see your stats on the app and online. And you can check them out at rapidshot.com. Uh, great small business. I actually grew up with one of the owner's sons and have played with all the family members by now. Uh, just in local pickups here in Ohio. Very cool local business. Awesome product. I love it. I know quite a few NHLers have them in their homes. Uh, a lot of D1 programs have it at their rinks. So you have to check this out. Rapidshot.com. Check it out. Rapidshot, thank you so much for sponsoring our podcast. On the Hockey IQ podcast today, we bring on Neil Conway. Uh, Neil's a bit of a stud goalie coach out there. Uh, he's producing NHL talent, NCAA talent, uh, U.S. National Development Team talent. Uh, maybe it's just something up in the waters in Cleveland, but uh, Neil knows what he's doing, so I'm excited to talk some goaltending. Thanks for coming on, Neil. Thanks for having me. Well, we, we started before this talking on uh, goalies like golfers. I think that might be a good place to start because goaltending uh, – they do get a little bit of a reputation for being a little crazy between the ears, but uh, that might be something that drives them forward. And, you know, one year they're amazing. The next year they stink or the exact opposite where they stink and suddenly they're winning Vesna. So curious to hear your thoughts on, on goaltending uh, from a mental standpoint to start. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, it's always a, a touchy subject. And I think, uh, you know, I think most hockey coaches or normal hockey guys feel, uh, in goaltending, they're like, they don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. But at the same time, I think there's so many coaches, you know, as they rightfully should, um, you look at the problem in Edmonton, it's like when your goalies don't play well, uh, you are completely at their mercy and it's really hard to win. And uh, I think a lot of coaches kind of focus on stuff like soft goals or just goals they don't like. And it's, it's, it's easy to point the finger, but um, you know, goaltending is pretty tough and comparing it to golf is always uh, I think a, an efficient, um, analogy just because a lot of hockey guys play golf and I think everybody knows how hard of a how hard of a sport it is and it's um it gets it gets the point across most of the time I think yeah I, I mean like uh Jordan Spieth would be a perfect example for us to talk about here I mean the guy was lights out when he came into the PGA tour struggled for almost three years and then comes back and is winning a major again and is playing well it's it's crazy to see like you, you knew the talent was always there yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's where, you know, picking goalies and scouting goalies and evaluating goalies. I mean, you talk to probably any NHL team, like scouting and evaluating goalies is always tough. And uh, when you when you go to look at guys and all the factors that go into it, it's like, you know, just like a player, you got your skating, you got your skill sets, you got, you know, your hockey IQ. Can you read the play, do this and that? But with a goalie, you're, you're so kind of uh, – I don't know what the word is, if it's like vulnerable, but you're kind of like uh, susceptible to if your mental game is not 100 percent, like you, you literally have nothing. And I always, you know, whenever you see goalies just get scored on too much or they're letting in bad goals and, you know, coaches get frustrated. I'm, I always kind of tell them, like, how do you like, you know, they always say, like, how do you let that in? And I'm like, well, how do you miss a four foot putt or a two foot putt? And it's like, think about it. Like, how many times on the golf course do you miss? a two or a four foot putt. And you, I mean, you could sometimes you miss it three or four times in a row. And it's like, it just happens. You know what I mean? And it's not about always like working harder and sometimes, you know, gripping the club tighter, we all know makes things a lot worse, like swing harder and gripping the club tighter make problems in golf a lot worse. And it's very similar for goaltending where it's like, what do you say? Like, just sometimes you're not that sharp. And then there's other times where it's like, on the green or wherever part of the course you want to talk about, it's like, you can sink a 50 foot putt and it's like, how'd that go in? You're like, I don't know. I, you know, you try to do this and that right. And then at the end of the day, sometimes it just goes in and you're just mentally sharp um, and everything's going your way. And Jordan Spieth was top of the world for a couple of events there. And then of course he was on the other end of the spectrum for a couple of years and now he's back and goaltending couldn't, uh, couldn't be more similar. 
Well, uh, you're, you're a perfect example. You had some adversity in your career, um, but it ended up as you were being in the right place at the right time. Uh, your mental game clearly had to be on to, to win a national title uh, in Canadian college. So I'm curious to hear, hear that journey that you went through. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, I experienced all those things firsthand where, uh, you know, when your mental game is there in goaltending, you're pretty hard to beat. And I had a couple good years at juniors, uh, got to the OHL, had a really solid first season. And then uh, when your mental game is not there, man, it's tough. It's tough to keep that puck out of the net when you're, uh, when you're struggling between the ears. And then uh, kind of got my feet under me later in my OHL career and then ended up taking my uh, OHL package money and going to Canadian University and uh, went to a really good program at St. Mary's out in Halifax. And then, you know, it, within any, you know, season, there's always going to be good games and bad games. But um, luckily, it kind of all came together for me at the right time. And you uh, in those moments, you know, as a goalie, like when you get hot on a playoff run, part of you kind of knows like you just can't get beat. And it's really hard to. Uh, you know, pinpoint exactly what it is. Cause you, you know, you can't, you can't always replicate those things as much as you want. I think everybody would like to be like, okay, well just, why don't you do that all the time? And it's like, well, that's not, that's not how it works. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we got, uh, we got hot there and you know, my, uh, my, my head and my game was feeling good. And um, yeah, we won, uh, won a national championship. We beat uh, university of Alberta who, if you follow Canadian university hockey, they win it. Uh, almost every other year, it seems like they're kind of like the New York Yankees. And it was uh, yeah, a special time. Anybody, you know, who's won a championship at that level knows how, how hard it is and how fun it is and how rewarding it is. Well, I'm curious to dive into maybe some specifics. Like what do you think you led to your struggles mentally? What was that like for you going through that? And then on the back end, what were some things that you did to help get yourself out of that um, and maintain it and get hot at the right time? Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's, it's always, you know, I think a big part of it is always mental maturity, you know, just being, you know, 17 years old, you're, you're kind of a kid. Right. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to coaching, uh, of course there's plenty of goalie guys out there. Um, but at that time there weren't many goalie coaches and none of my coaches in the OHL at that time were goalie guys. And they had kind of like we were just talking about a bit of like a old school, uh, tough mentality where, you know, if you weren't playing well, everything was about, you know, work harder, do better, like whatever. If, if you're letting in soft goals, you know, it's, it's just, you know, cause you're not working hard enough. You're not, you know, swinging hard enough. So to say, and we all know like just with the golf analogy, like as a goalie, if you try too hard, you swing too hard, you're gripping the club too tight. It's really, really tough. And so, you know, if you're a coach out there and your goalies are really struggling, like, you know, it's a, it's a fine balance to, you know, make sure those guys are focused, dialed in and, you know, working for every puck in practice. But at the same time, if, if your goalies are fighting it and trying too too hard, the, the problems are only going to uh, kind of uh, multiply themselves. And I think, you know, to get yourself out of it, you know, as a, as a goalie, it's always important to just kind of take a step back and, you know, I'm sure a lot of guys have figured out a lot of different ways for me. Like a big thing was learning about yoga and I'm sure, you know, it's kind of a popular thing. And for good reason, though, a lot of goalies like to do yoga and, you know, from a mental standpoint, you focus on your breathing, you calm down, you, you know, you're not, uh, you know, the flexibility and stuff like that is always beneficial, but I think that the mental part and the attitudes uh, you go through uh, in yoga, where it's just, you know, whatever you call it, self-reflection and, just calming your mind down were uh, pretty big for me because I would take that forward and use that as part of my warm up routines. And then um, it's, it's definitely a process like, you know, just like becoming a better player. It's like from the OHL to CIS to pro it's like, well, you're developing as a player over, you know, whatever you call that three, five, 10 years, it's the same thing for your mental game, right? Like piecing together your mental game is a long-term development kind of thing just learning how your mind works weren't learning what does and doesn't work for you to keep you focused and to keep you calm and to keep your ability to execute high yeah i've always heard that uh you want to be really aggressive 
uh, with like your positioning, but really calm with your eyes and kind of like let the puck come to you rather than fighting it. Like that was like the mental analogy. My brother was a goalie that he always used. It's like, yeah, I want to have really calm eyes, like really sharpen his movements, but then like really soft and like letting that puck almost like just hit him. Yeah. Yeah, no. And that, that's a great way to describe it. And, you know, everybody like in goaltending kind of, and this is what it, it's like any intangible thing. It's kind of really hard to pinpoint or describe things, but whatever makes sense to you mentally is, is really important to figure out. But in a sense, your mind is really calm, right? Like you, you've got to watch the puck kind of intricately and there's a lot of little, you know, fakes and, and deception and things like that. And then it's like, you got the back door, you got, you know, all sorts of factors kind of running through your mind where you've got to be like calm and cerebral watching it. But then at the same time, it's like, you've got to have that explosiveness. You've got to have that competitiveness. You've got to have that intensity. And that's a really uh, accurate way uh, to depict goaltending in a sense, which is like, yeah, your, your head and your mind are really calm, but then your body's ready to kind of uh, attack and fight and, you know, uh, compete for pucks. Well, I think we should uh, switch some gears here a little bit because that was, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, you've worked with some goalies that have gone to the highest of highs. Um, you can name drop if you want, but uh, I'd really like to focus on, on Colin Purcell, uh, who wasn't even a known factor really in the city yet, almost like overnight was getting shots with the U.S. National Development Program. So I'm curious to hear his story from your perspective. Um, and then also maybe some of the other goalies you've worked with about getting them to places where they're able to compete at the highest of highs. Yeah. Yeah. Colin's a, a great, uh, great story and a great case study. You know, he's kind of the uh, poster boy, a little bit of, uh, you know, Cleveland uh, goaltending uh, in a sense, because he, he came up just as like, you know, another kid, he was never, um, regarded at a young age as uh you know you would call it like a, a prospect like you know there's those kids out there from you know 10 or 12 years old you're like oh he's the best player on the team he's going this way going that way like he was playing at that double a triple a level he wasn't exactly on like a top 10 ranked team and going to um you know whatever super events like that from a young age but <clears throat> when uh when i retired uh from playing i had my first year coaching uh, pro over in Europe in uh, the Austrian league. And then after that season, I wanted to come back home. So I came back home in April and it was a uh, tryout season for the uh, 15 new uh, Cleveland Barons team. And Kyle Kanicki was the coach of that team. And he, he, you know, wanted me to come to tryouts to help evaluate the goalies. He's like, Hey, I'm looking at this Purcell kid. He's a pretty big kid at that time. Colin was, you know, 15 years old and about six foot three. So it was like, Oh, he's a pretty big kid. And what was interesting for me, it was only, you know, my first year or so of coaching and I was used to watching pro hockey. And then of course, only a year or two before that I was, you know, playing pro hockey. And so I didn't have a, a firm grasp. I'm like, what is a good 15 year old? You know what I mean? Like, so I came to trial. So I was like, Oh, I'm like, this kid's pretty good. I'm like, man, for 15, I was like, he's really big. He's really good athlete. And I'm like, obviously I could tell him like, he's never been coached, but I was like, there's a lot of good pieces here. And I, I, I was kind of uncertain in my own opinion though, of like what a good 15 year old. Cause I was like, well, if I put him in a pro hockey game tomorrow, he's going to kind of get eaten alive. But I was like, for 15, I think he's all right. And anyways, he made the team. And as the season's going along, you know, we're, we're working a lot uh, on goalie stuff and he's, he's a worker. He, he, he's a real, uh, workhorse type of kid like you you tell him to do something he's going to do it and then anyways this was his uh 15 year baron season he was getting a lot of attention because he was just putting up a lot of big games like you know uh the cleveland barons put out a lot of good teams like right now i think their 15 year team is like fifth or sixth in the country a pretty elite team that year they were not they were not very good they were closer to you know 75th in the country and he was like you know shutting out victory honda and then beating the pens elite and just there's a lot of kind of eye-opening games for a team that wasn't very good. And then, um, yeah, he ended up getting drafted to uh, the OHL. He got drafted by the Kitchener Rangers. Uh, Youngstown Phantoms drafted him. And then that summer, uh, he ended up making the U.S. under-17 select team. So he also went to the NTDP 40-man camp. So he was really close to making uh, NTDP because they'd only bring in five or six goalies to their 40 man camp. And then it's, you know, a week long trial or whatever. So they didn't take him there, but then in the summertime, 
he made the uh, under 17 Five Nations tournament. And then I think the following year, he did one more year of midget hockey with Barons, and then he was off to the USHL, and then he committed to UMass. And you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of interesting parts of the story. But I mean, he <clears throat> is a very good skater. So now he's six foot seven. So you know, he was fit six three when he was uh, 15 years old. Now he's grown to six foot seven, and he is uh, an outstanding athlete and an outstanding skater uh, with a great work ethic. So it's like when you put all those things together. Um, it makes for a pretty attractive goalie, which is why he's, uh, you know, committed to play division one. And he's had, uh, had the injury bug a little bit, which has always been, uh, tough through COVID because, you know, you're, there, there's always COVID stuff going on the last two years. So a couple of his seasons have been, you know, broken apart. And then, uh, you know, he hasn't played as many games as he wanted to, but it'll be interesting to see how, uh, his progression goes the next couple of years. Yeah, excellent. And so what what are the things? So you're working with a Colin, you're working with a Ned. What does that look like uh, or any goaltending? Because it seems like every goaltender you touch gets way better. So I'm curious of, you know, what are you focusing on? How are you improving these goalies? Uh, you know, consider me like a coach who doesn't know anything about goaltending, even though I may know a little bit through my brother. But whatever I know, it's probably outdated by now. What, what are the things that you're focusing on with these guys? So the, the process, you know, there's always a process in anything in life to, to get better and to, you know, build something. And I'd say the, the two things we really attack are one is the skill set, which is usually just, you know, skating speed, like all the traditional stuff, just in terms of your crease movements and a little bit of the efficiency and uh, how you skate. Um, it's real easy to be fast and waste energy and then really not get a lot done. Um, so we really do a lot of skating, uh, at, you know, every session I do every camp I do like really teaching the kids how to skate and how to use their bodies just to generate a little more energy and power in uh, all their movements, whether it's your T pushes, your shuffles, your slides, just, there's a lot of, you know, little, little tips. And then also part of it is like just doing the work, right? Like you just, you want to get good at something. You got to do it a million times. Right. Like I think, um, sometimes people think there's like a life hack for everything. And it's like, well, sometimes you just got to do the work. Right. Um, and then the other part of it is just from a, a positional strategic standpoint, you really want kids or goalies to like think the game, right? Like, I think we all see hockey players sometimes where it's like they make decisions where you're like, that's just a terrible decision. Like you're really not, whether you make this pass or you don't make that pass or, you know, whatever the situation would be in hockey, you know, for goalies, it's the same. It's like, why are you standing here in this situation? Or like, why are you doing this in that situation? And, it, and you know, you can sometimes, you know, uh, do things a different way. Like there's not necessarily always a wrong, right or a wrong way, but it's under, letting them understand what are you trying to do? Like, what are you trying to do on this type of play? And it's like, okay, if they understand strategically, like we are trying to do this, it would just be like a breakout. It's like, what are we really trying to do? Like, we are literally just trying to get the puck across the red line. It's like, okay, you can do that a lot of different ways, but it's like, if you do that, this is what you can't do. And then this is what you can't, you know, wh whatever the situation is. So I'd say there's for us, you know, we really focus on two things, which is the skill set and then kind of the strategic aspect of it, of letting, or I'd say making sure they understand what they're trying to do out there. That's awesome. And then from that, you, you have so many, like I've, I've had a few of your goalies on teams that I've coached in the past and, and seen some of the work you've been doing. Uh, I'm curious, you do all this stuff on ice. What does that off ice component look like for goaltending training? Cause there's so much that goes into it from flexibility, video analysis, workouts, et cetera. Um, I'd say from an off ice perspective, like I'd say it's, it's somewhat traditional uh, in the sense that like you want guys just strong and healthy. Um, you know, goalies don't need to, you know, do puck battles in the corner. So it's like, do you really need to be like, super strong bench press whatever all the traditional stuff no but it's also like you want your guys uh lift and weights and like you know just a healthy like normal way i would call it where it's like yeah like the goalies should be in the gym whatever two or three days a week with the rest of the team now if they want to do a little more flexibility stuff or like they don't need to go super heavy but it's also like you want them to be elite athletes you want them to be strong you want them to be healthy and um no, they don't have to be able to like push a guy off a puck, but it's also like, you just want them to 
be able to move their frames around the crease as efficiently as possible. And um, I think, you know, that's where I tell most of my guys, I'm like, you know, there's a lot of different strength coaches and a million different things are always changing in the strength world. And I'm like, just be healthy and be strong. Um, and then I always, like I mentioned before, um, really want guys to do yoga on a weekly basis. And, you know, the, the flexibility part of it is great. Um, but also the mental aspect, like just teaching guys like the breathing techniques and kind of calming, calming themselves down and not thinking too much. Cause that's a huge thing in goaltending. It's like, there's so much going on out there it's really easy to just start thinking about every little thing. And then you kind of forget about the puck right in front of you. And, you know, you get just beat on straight shots. Um, and then from a video I'm standpoint, guilty on that one, by the way, I, I <laughs> dressed up in pads a few times and I was like, Oh, I need to be doing this and this and this. And I was totally in my head. And then like puck comes when you're not expecting it and boom, you're like, should not be getting beat through me. Right. Right. That, that's exactly it. Right. So um, yeah. And then uh, yeah, from video, you know, just like with thinking too much in goaltending, it's easy to like, you know, go over every single play and like from every game, you could watch a goalie play and, you know, pick apart every single little thing. And it's like, then you just get the guys thinking too much. And that's a, that's just a, I think a coaching thing is that usually from each game, like you're going to pick, you know, one, two or three things and be like, Hey, we're going to focus on this. And then you address it and then you move forward. It's like, you don't want to show a guy 25 clips from a game and, try to work on those 20 things each week. It's like, just pick one thing a week and keeping your goalies very focused on one or two things is I think uh, really important for their development. And how do you take this video analysis? So obviously you probably do it within the year and having these conversations as they're with their teams and you're taking live barn or instead or whatever that may be. But what does that look like maybe in the off season when you're going through camps and helping springboard the learning process uh, a little bit more? Um, when we're, when we like record and we go over our, uh, our sessions in the summer, um, a lot of it goes back to, you know, cause those aren't, you know, it's all drills, right? So it's not like game situation live stuff as much. Um, a big part of it is, uh, I don't know if you guys ever talk about the inner game of tennis or, uh, that book yeah yeah inner game of tennis is great um i also really enjoy the power within discovering the path to elite goaltending by our yeah. main man justin mm -hmm. yeah i think those so, two are the best yeah yeah and so you know i i'd say when you're when you're going over video from drills and you're going through that process it's it's more so letting them understand themselves in a sense where it's like okay like what are you feeling on this play or like why are you doing this here and then they kind of work through it themselves where they're like well you know, a lot of guys sometimes answer, I don't know. And you're like, well, what, what do you want to do? Like, what, like, like you're, you're standing up here and you're like doing this and that. And it's like, do you really need to do that? And then, you know, they, the, the answers kind of um, come to them in a sense. So I'd say a lot of the um, summertime drill video analysis is usually about them just watching themselves because so many times, like, just like anything in life, you, you watch a video of yourself and you're like, Oh, like, why am I doing that? Right. Like it's just a self-awareness is created and that in itself kind of is um, the biggest thing for these, these, you know, goaltenders that are trying to get to the next level are like, Oh yeah, I don't really need to do that. Do I? I'm like, no, like, look at, look at how much time there is. Look at how much space there is. Like just kind of learn to wait, learn to understand where the net is and how much, how much time you have. Right. So you're asking questions to create self-awareness. Am yeah. I getting that correctly? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's a big part of it. Right. Um, and then, you know, you can always like just directly comment on things, but at the same time, I think so much of it is just about them learning to, you know, be like create self-awareness and understand what's going on out there. I think that is amazing because so many players do it so many different ways and it goes to goaltending as well. If they're, you know, they're not robots back there and like allowing them to find solutions that work for them. I think that's critical. I mean, obviously there's the basics that you need to have, you know, head on a swivel, identifying targets, being able to read the game, but then finding a solution that works for you. Like JS Jaguar was much different than Marty Brodor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like they're, and that's the thing too. It's like, even in the NHL now, it's like a lot of guys play a lot of different ways. And like, <laughs> it's, it's just funny how sometimes there's, you know, coaches that are like, no, like you can't do this. You can't do that. And then it's like, 
hockey and whatever life kind of goes through cycles. And it's like, all of a sudden I see guys doing things now that whatever, 10 or 15 years ago, were like outlawed, like, Oh no, don't do that. That's stupid. Like, that's a bad idea, this and that. But it's like, well, guess what? Like, because of this and that, here we are again. And guys are doing certain moves that, you know, guys didn't used to do. And it's like, Hey man, like you just, goalies got to figure out what works for them. And there's 64 goalies in the NHL. And I'd say maybe 10 of them play like a very identical style, but it's like the other 54 guys are all kind of all over the map and they're obviously good enough to be in that league. Right. Yeah. I'm curious from, from your perspective, um, what does that evolution looks like? What, what are some of those things that used to be outlawed that are now maybe more common play? So a big thing now is like the, the dead angle play and like the, the overlap. So uh, I don't know if you guys have talked at all about like the RVH. So like, of course, everybody talks about the RVH now and how goalies go in RVH too much. And, you know, you get beat over that short side from a bad angle on the post because you're down early, essentially. So a lot of goalies are now doing the overlap. But the thing is, is that the overlap in a way is kind of just like playing the shooter normally. Like you're just staying out on the shooter on a dead angle, which used to be a really bad idea because the problem is, is that when it does go back door or across the rink, it's really hard to get there because you're kind of out of the crease on a bad angle. Um, Now, a couple of guys played a different couple of different ways. Some guys just play it straight square to the shooter on a bad angle. And if they go back door, they go back door and you're like, whatever, at least let the D worry about that. And I won't get beat on this shot. Other guys kind of turn off square, like their feet are angled towards the center but because it's a bad angle, you can kind of get away with that. Um, And so playing overlap is now an acceptable technique by a lot of goalie coaches and a lot of guys in the NHL. However, for a while it was like, no, you can't do that. You have to play the VH or the RVH and you have to be able to get across there. But then shooters are learning now, like hitting that short side bar down when the goalies at the bad angle, it's really not that hard of a shot. Um, You see every night in the NHL, somebody kind of misplays it and it goes bar down and uh, it's a bad angle goal. Nobody likes it, but at the same time, you know, the goalies are trying to manage both issues, right? So, uh, the overlap is now an acceptable technique so that you don't get beat on the RVH. Uh, but for a while, you know, a lot of people didn't like it because you're totally exposed going across the ice. Right. So it's like, you know, there's always this whole back and forth about what's right, what's wrong and whatnot. And it's like each goalie's just got to figure it out for themselves and you know, well, it's, it's about managing the risk, right? Like the, the reason the RVH came about was rebound control in the first place. I mean, yeah, that's my understanding. Of, yeah, a little bit. And I think the biggest thing that like I, I saw was that when guys were going, when you go VH on a wrapper, a jam, like you think about a wrapper, a jam going in the net, like it's a, it's a weak goal because it's like, it's usually on the ice and all the guy, like it doesn't take a lot of skill. You're literally just going to jam the post and squeak it through there somehow. And when you go RVH, you know, all your weight is on that short side post and it's easy to go paddle down. Even on the glove side, you could go paddle down on the rebound. So you're, you're completely eliminating the chances of giving up a jam. But the thing is, just like butterfly, right? Like if you think about butterfly it's like, Butterflying is obviously a pretty important move and goalies use it every single play, but can you still butterfly too early all the time? If you go, if you go butterfly too early, guys are going to be over, over top. And RVH is the same way. If you're going RVH too early when the puck is not close to the net, guess what? Whole top half of the net's open. So it's just kind of like that whole evolutionary process of like, okay, like we've got to stop this play. We've been getting beat on the you know, the jam too much because we were going VH where you don't have weight on the post. You don't have a good seal. There's all these like little holes available and you're just giving up soft jam goals. So then it's like, okay, we're going to go RVH all the time now, RVH to seal up the bottom of the net on the jam plays. But then it's like, well, guess what? Now we're in RVH all the time. Even when the puck's not close to the net, top corners are open, you know? And it's like, you get into these, whatever you call it. It's almost like a figure eight of uh, continuous. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's the cat and mouse game evolution. And uh, for those non-goalie folks that are wondering what the heck we're talking about right now, I will uh, push you to the hockey IQ newsletter where we actually have the history of post play out there from uh, our goalie expert, Josh Howell and myself. So we can dive into what we're talking about when we talk in VH and RVH and all of that stuff. Uh, easy, easy Google, just history of post play uh, and you'll find it. So, uh, Continuing on this evolution beyond post play and dead angles, is there any other areas that you're seeing things change? I remember when 
Jonathan Quick came in. That was kind of a major thing where he was just like, I'm going to take everything down low and try to worry about box control and really challenging players to lift it over and, and finding those angles early. Um, yeah, you know what? Uh, the only other thing that seems like it's kind of uh, – going back and forth between a lot of different goalies in the NHL is how much depth they're getting on the rush. So it used to be come way out on like a two on one or a three on two. And then you flow back. And when I say flow back, it's just like a breakaway. Okay. On a breakaway, you come, you know, everybody comes out a little bit more or less, but the whole idea is on a breakaway, you come out and then you glide back with the shooter. And then you kind of manage that speed and that gap and uh, you know, try to make a save on the rush. A lot of goalies, uh, because of Henrik Lundqvist, realized like, okay, on a three on two, uh, you really don't have to challenge. Lundqvist, you know, he was playing real deep in the crease all the time, but it's like he was arguably one of the most consistent goalies over his career from a year to year basis, right? And a lot of guys started to see like, wow, this is like a really effective, simple technique. It's like, what do you do? You almost just do nothing. You just kind of stand there and then, you know, you make the save or you go across the crease. Um, but now it seems like there's a lot of goalies going back to the old way, which is kind of like coming way out, flowing back. So you kind of have two different uh, strategies there where uh, some guy like Mike Smith is one um, where guys are sitting back in the crease on a wide entry on the rush plays. And they're, they're really not getting out very far and they're real comfortable and pretty effective at making saves from deep in the crease, because unless it's a breakaway or like a real tight two on one, it's like, the guy usually doesn't get to that elite of a, a scoring position, but then at the same time, now you have guys like Saros is a great example. It's like on the rush play, he's coming way out, coming way back. Even Matt Murray for a while back in his Pittsburgh days, he was really a lot more conservative on the rush. And then now, uh, you know, the last couple of years, it's like, he's been coming way out on the rush and flowing back with the guy. It looks like a breakaway, even though it's a, whatever, a, you know, a three on two or something. Right. So yeah, I'm interested to see where that one goes and uh, see if there's any, you know, dominating trends or maybe it'll just be case by case. Each guy just figures his own way out, you know? So I'm always curious uh, what coaches think about if you're setting your team up, how should they play a two on one? Should the defenseman take away the pass, give the goalie the shooter, you play a little bit of both. Do you like the slide? What, what's your thoughts on, on the defenseman helping out and communicating with the goalie to play a two-on-one? You know, it, it would be so simple if you could say, just cover the pass and then uh, goalie takes a shooter. But, you know, we all know that, like, that's not how it works, right? If it was that simple, then it really wouldn't be a two-on-one. It would just be a breakaway. <laughs> um, and I see that happen in youth hockey a lot. You know, it's, it's a good thing to teach kids. Be like, hey, goalies, like, you got to own the shooter. And that's a really important principle. But at the same time, it's like, the D has to play the two on one. And when I think about the two on one, it's like, listen, you've got to cover the back door, but you still have to eliminate that shooter or the puck carriers space. Like you've, you've got to try to hold them at bay. And, you know, it's a little game of cat and mouse, right? Like that's, you know, most of hockey is like everything can boil down to a two on one somewhere. And it's like, well, the D if you just back right off and you just tie up the back door, it's like, you're just giving that guy a breakaway, which really isn't that helpful. And at the same time, if you're biting too early too often and that pass is getting across there every single time, it's like you're making the goalie's job harder. Cause without a doubt, when that pass gets across and you've got to move over, you know, you call it the Royal road and all that kind of stuff, all those percentages about when the pass goes across that middle line, like it is hard to make a save, right? It's, it's not easy to make a save in general from uh, a prime scoring area, let alone having to go from, you know, side to side uh, on a, on a rush play. Yeah, uh, I would say that go goalies need to start with some assumption and same with the defenders who are on the same page, and then you can always change it. Uh, I was at the Leafs slash CBJ game the other night, and um, the defenseman just took away the pass, which was Boone Jenner, and gave away the shooter, which was Patrick Laine. Um I, I bet we all know where this was heading, but yeah. uh, Laine did score. <laughs> I was like, um, I think it's kind of like, if Brett Hall was coming down, like usually you want to shade on, on the pass. I think on that one, maybe a shade on the shooter, just a little bit. You know, have a little awareness of who's coming down because uh, yeah. percentages yeah. are different based on different players. It's tough. It's tough, right? Like that's, I mean, you know, that's why a two on one is, you know, uh, a very high end scoring opportunity. Right. And I, I would think too, like at that level, I would, I would think sometimes the, uh, the D and the goalies could be on the same page where, you know, 
at a young level, you're going to start with something as simple as like, Hey, like this is the, the basic idea where we're going to focus on the shooter or uh, you know, and the D is going to try to get the pass a little bit, but then, you know, there's always variables where you're like, Hey, if I have a, you know, a righty coming down the right wing, like I kind of want you to do this a little bit more. If I have a guy coming down his off wing, try to do this a little bit more, right? Like there's always those little things that for the goalie and the D, if they're on the same page, I'm sure they could strategically try to um, keep guys at bay a little bit, but you know, it's never, uh, never easy. That's for sure. Well, let's, uh, let's turn to the opposite side. So let's say that uh, you're a goalie coach on an NHL club and you're scouting the other team's goalies or you just want to give them better ideas how to score more goals how do you help your team and your shooters score more goals because you obviously know from a goalie perspective what's difficult what's hard um maybe i'm wrong i always tell my team uh if, when in doubt and you've run out of space or you've run out of ideas uh throw it in the goalie's feet always seems like a good option yeah yeah it is i mean you know it's like screening the goalie you're playing against a great goalie what do you do take away his eyes right it's it's hard to make a save if you can't see the puck um i mean yeah at, at every level uh i've been at like uh scouting the opposing goalies during a you know a playoff run or what you know whatever it is like when you're going to see a goalie a couple of times um either the goalie coach or the goalies themselves usually have some input i um usually look for certain things on the power play just, or like, you know, a, a rush play two on one, for example, like there's some goalies where they play it a certain way where, you know, like anything, it's like, Hey, like you're, you, they manage certain risks, but it's like, if you get to play here, they're going to be really exposed. Right. So, you know, if you see on a two on one that a goalie is like three or four feet out of the crease, it's like, what do you do? It's like, you make the early pass. Like, you know, that's a, a strategy in general on a lot of two on ones is like you hit that blue line, send a pass over right away. Well, if the goalie's out three or four feet out of the crease, think about how far that is to get across when there's a pass. Right. So um, yeah, scouting the opposing goalies from a, a goaltending's perspective is, you know, I would say a regular thing at every single level where every goalie coaches, I, I think it would be situational. I mean, at any high level, I don't think there's too much uh, value in being like, Oh, shoot glove side. You know, like sometimes you hear that on sports center and um, you know, there's some announcer being like, Oh, they're targeting the glove side every time. It's like, you're not playing in the NHL if you can't make a glove save. You know what I mean? And then at the same time, it's also like you have to shoot somewhere and every shooter, every player kind of has their you know tendencies to be like, listen, if, if I don't know where to go, I'm going blocker. You know what I mean? Or like, a, you know, which, or glove, right? Like whatever it is. And I, I think that unless someone is really that bad, uh, there's no, you know, there's no value in just being like, Hey, if you get a, you know, open shot, go, go, go here. It's like, no, nobody at a high level is that bad where they can't make a block or a glove save. Everything's kind of situational or just strategic. And, you know, maybe it's a power play. Maybe it's a dead angle play. It's like, Hey, look for this, look for that. But nothing's uh, as simple as, you know, just go glove. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you uh, think about cross the grain? So like, if I, I'm a righty, I'm going from my left to the right. So the goalies right to left. Am I better going with the grain and going glove side or am I better going against the grain and going back on the blocker? So it's like any, any strategy, it's like, it's not a bad idea, but the thing is, is some goalies are really aware of it. And de depending on how they execute and play that play that time, it's like, I see a lot of times where you're like, yeah, going against the grain definitely will work. But then other times it's also like the goalie is almost overcompensating for it. So you've got to go the other way. Right. Um, so it's totally situational. I think it's like, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's easy to see when it works and everyone like kind of celebrates it. But at the same time, there's a lot of examples where you don't, uh, you don't necessarily want to do it. Right. Just kind of about reading the play. Fair enough. Um, and as a shooter, tell me if I was dumb as a player, uh, when I was looking at scouting the goalie on the other side during warmups, cause you know, we, we didn't have video and every single rink, uh, back in the day, um, I was looking at hands. So like when they went into a butterfly, did they kind of like drop their hands and kind of try to seal the six hole versus maybe like they hold them a little bit higher. And therefore that'll change my idea if I'm going high or if I'm going right over the pads with my shots, uh, my, my looking into the game too much here. Uh, no. So like, I don't think many, like, I don't think goalies focus on sealing the six hole. There are guys that <clears throat> try to like, they think they have all the net covered. So a simple, kind of lazy strategy is to like just cover all the net by making sure there's no holes um 
I think, I think sometimes guys just kind of get nervous and they like, they don't know where the shooter's going to go. So they kind of resort to just blocking. Right. And that's kind of, you know, a big debate nowadays in goaltending is like, do you block or do you react? Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you see that one uh, on the highlight reel every night is goalies, their glove starts up in like a traditional high position, the shot comes, their hand drops. And then of course, somebody goes bar down. And I think usually that just comes down to, um, reading and waiting on like, you know, patience. When you think about like, you know, even an MLB pitcher, right? Like think about that ball coming out of their hand, whether it's a curve ball or a fastball or whatever you're trying to read or anticipate. I mean, it's the same thing for a goalie, like right when that guy's about to release that puck, trying to pick up all those little things off the blade to see where it's going to go. And if you don't really wait, if you don't really see what's coming, you're just going to kind of, you know, go somewhere else, right? You're going to go the wrong direction and guess what? The puck's going in the net. So it's tough. Yeah. I don't know. I, it, you know, everybody has a different idea, but you know, to your question, um, sometimes you just got to shoot and hit the net. Shooters got to shoot, just throw pucks at the net sometimes. Yeah. I, mean, uh, I, know, I can I'm a, I'm a uh, get behind that. I'm a Maple Leafs fan and I watch Austin Matthews a lot. There's plenty of great goals where you see him pick a spot. I, see a lot of goals though where he's literally just hitting the net as hard as he can like literally just hit the net and rip it as hard as you can and it's like it found a six hole it found a five hole you know what i mean and it's like he didn't really look and you know identify that spot it's like he literally just ripped it as hard as he could and the goalie made a mistake right which is you know not a bad strategy it's like make the goalie make a save right don't just give him anything by missing the net true that well, uh, last question I have for you here. Um, I know you're big on athleticism and goaltending. What, what is athleticism? Um, part of it is skating, you know, so it's like those, those are definitely two interchangeable topics or words I should say in a sense. Like if you think about it, think about anybody who's an elite skater, are they a bad athlete? It would, you know, like, I don't think there's anybody who are like, yeah, he skates really well as a player, but he's just a terrible athlete. Like those don't usually make sense. And I think when you see guys be um, good athletes in the net, it means they can get around the crease. They can improvise. They can, they can maneuver themselves really quickly and make saves in really tough situations. Right. Um, When you see guys in the corner as, you know, forwards or whatever, like being dynamic, like they're going to cut left, they're going to cut right. And then they're going to get, you know, get to the net or whatever. It's like, you've got to skate really well. And at the same time, you've got to kind of have that dynamic athleticism to improvise in situations that you can't really prepare for. Um, and I think that's a big part of it is that as goalies, like you can't prepare for a lot of things, but you've got to be able to compete really well. You got to be able to move your body and skate uh, in situations that you can't prepare for. So I think that's kind of uh, what people mean when they say like, is he a good athlete? It's like, yeah, well, you know, there's situations that usually you're not in position for, but if you can be dynamic and athletic around the crease and skate pretty well. You're, you're going to have a chance to make those, you know, 10 bell saves. All right. Circling back to the beginning and, and then uh, I'll let you have the floor for whatever you want. Uh, so what does a good 15 year old goalie look like? <laughs> uh, it's tough to describe uh, in words. Like if you watch them, I mean, what you would see, is a kid who's fast and skates well and is athletic, which are really kind of tough things to, uh, you know, I guess like quantify, right? Like, how do you quantify those things? How do you measure those things? I I think it's pretty tough. You just want to see kids like, just like as a player, like, what does he do really well? It's like gets up and down the ice really well, makes dynamic plays, like moves the puck, like gets to the net. Same thing as a goalie, like moves around the crease really well, battles on pucks, like doesn't get beat on, you know, simple plays, like it's all, all the kind of the the most fundamental things you want to see guys do. Awesome. Well, Neil, this was absolutely fantastic. Uh, anything that we missed or you want to circle back on or just have the floor to talk about the easy crease. Uh, it's all yours. Uh, no, it's been, been great, uh, being on here. You know, the only thing that easy crease that I, I, I kind of say to coaches, you know, a lot of coaches don't like to, uh, you know, try to help with the goalies because they feel like they're going to do something wrong. But, you know, in life, sometimes it's like the simplest things can make the biggest difference. And a lot of guys are always worried about the goalies playing well, but at the same time, you know, uh, unless there's a goalie coach there, they don't get much coaching. And it's like, 
if you're doing small area games or you have the net somewhere where you're doing whatever drill, it's like the simplest things can make the biggest difference. And if you give your goalies a crease uh, during a drill, it's like not only does it make them feel involved and kind of, you know, remembered and cared about, but it also just gives them a little bit of accountability. It gives them a little bit more net awareness. And it's just, you know, the, the simplest thing can sometimes make uh, the biggest difference. So that's obviously why uh, we invented the product Easy Crease and we're trying to get it out there to coaches and goalies everywhere. Well, maybe describe exactly what the easy crease is for everyone. I'll put a link in the show notes. Everyone can uh, go and get one because they're awesome. And uh, yeah. I hope Marty St. Louis gets his easy crease here shortly because uh, I know he was at practice and he had some archaic ranked design. I think what was it like shoelace and that. he was driving, driving his little Sharpie marker. Like he, he needs to get official about this. He's, he's the NHL head coach right. of an original six team. Yeah, no, we're going to take care of Marty and make sure he gets set up. But yeah, Marty, Marty's obviously, uh, a, 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 you know, he's a big USA hockey guy and uh, now he's with Montreal, but he was uh, giving his goalies a crease. Uh, but also he wanted his players to have it, which is kind of a cool thing that I had never even thought of. But anyways, for anyone who doesn't know, the easy crease is just a crease protractor. So if you've ever been to your USA hockey clinics, you know, they always emphasize give your goalies a crease, which they tell you to take um, – a hockey lace attached to a carabiner and tape it to a marker, which you definitely can do. Most people don't do it. An easy crease, our product is a, a crease protractor on a retractable cord. So, you know, we kind of do it all for you where it's a retractable cord hooks up to uh, an open hook carabiner. And then we have a really nice marker that draws a regulation crease every single time. That's the perfect length. And it's just, you know, a simple product that coaches can keep in their bag and, keep uh keeping their pocket on the ice and when you go to play three on three or any small area game you can just slap a crease down right away for those goalies and kind of make them feel a part of things and they can work on their depth and their angles when uh the net is not there and you don't have to hear your goalies complain anymore about why they're getting scored on during three on three so much yeah that, that cross ice three on three with no no crease it's good for them they gotta hit their spots too Right. Right. Exactly. Well, then, then, you know, they're always like, I don't know where my net is and they have a million excuses. And now you can, uh, now you can address that. Now you can actually yell at them with good, good reason. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's perfect. So everybody. Hates awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Neil, for popping on here. This was uh, great. Now, now I've got some more tools to beat some goalies uh, as a shooter and, and improve my game as a goalie when I'm actually in the net. Awesome. Can't wait. That concludes this week's episode. Thanks for joining us here at Hockey IQ. If you haven't already, take a quick moment to hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop a review. If you want to be a great teammate, even recommend us to a friend. You can follow us at Hockey's Arsenal on Twitter and Instagram. Check out the website, hockeysarsenal.com, where you can subscribe to the weekly newsletter. You won't regret it. Catch you buttes here next week for a brand new episode.